ship. He's landing on Earth, and he forgot to pack his parachute. You know, I said in the beginning when I talked about uh, free fall and new product development, everybody today wants speed. You know, is this just an American thing or is it a global thing? The truth of the matter, it's a global thing, but I kind of go back to what I call testosterone speed. If nothing else, if we have a big pile of dust, we're making a lot of speed. Anybody notice that? Anybody here ever see a big pile of dust in your company and everybody pretends like they're, oh, we're making a lot of progress to the market? Am I the only one? Oh, yeah. Come on. All right, so what we're going to talk about is some brand new work that's just gotten published. So this is some brand new stuff that's coming out about how you look at information to develop new products. And it's really kind of neat stuff. So it's, it's, uh, we'll use some terms here. So when we're talking, uh, I'm going to hit that button. It's sort of like if there's, a, there's an old English term which was called the forlorn hope. And these were the guys that were in the army that nobody liked. They put them in the front line and they were the first ones who ran up to the wall of the castle or battlefield or whatever. And they normally all got killed. If you survived, you got promoted. Isn't that a wonderful thing? How many people have been in a new product development like that? Just throw people at it. Keep throwing it against the wall, keep bashing them up, and if, they, if you run out with them, what do you do? You get a bunch of new people. Anybody ever gone into a company and realized that you're replacing somebody before you who got fired because they couldn't deliver the new product on time? Isn't that a wonderful thought? Uh, the other thing we want to talk about is expecting to succeed in any business endeavor without knowledge. Anybody ever done that? Succeeded without knowledge? We have a lot of urban legend stories. We have people who, but how many people failed without knowledge? We never talk about that. You know, in new product development, the current mantra is to say that out of 100 new product ideas that go into development, only three are successful in the marketplace. 100 fail, uh, 97 fail. Almost 100 fail each time and three succeed. Now, that's terrible odds. So why did you pick this as a career? Help me out here. If failure is your option, why are you wanting to be here? Go learn about social networking or we can do the waterfall thing and we can do the agile thing and all that. All these different techniques, right? Well, we're talking about new product development. And what we want to know is that maybe there are methodologies in new product development that help people, help people to get promoted and make more money. How many people here want to get promoted? Anybody? Only about half. How many people want to make a lot of money? Anybody? Some people aren't alive in here. I already killed off some people. Are you asleep back there? Move for me. Okay, thank you. Good Lord, you don't want to make a lot of money. Oh, who wants to make just a moderate amount of money? What's a moderate? You know, I, when I talk to organizations, I say, what's a huge success? And I, I'm literally, a couple of weeks ago, I'm with a $3 billion company in new product development. They say a huge success is $50,000. It's like, duh. They have no knowledge of new product development. What they do is they put two sheets of plastic around plastic real thin around air. Anybody imagine what that product might be? Three billion dollar market? Back. Keep going. Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap. Alright, so, I mean, what better product could you have? And a successful new product is $50,000 and your main raw material is air? <laughs> I mean, what a business model. Good Lord, they have no knowledge. Oh, I think that's a good one. You go on their website, they have an art contest. How do you go on their website and you'll, you'll get this art contest where these kids color the dots of the bubbles and the bubbles are out or in. So you got innies and outies bubbles. Isn't that really clever? I mean, this is bizarre stuff in new product development. So we got the four long hope. Mostly everybody who does that is dead. So what are we gonna talk about? Failure. The reality is most of the things you're working on when you're working on new product development are failures. Isn't that a hoot? 
When you turn it around, you say to yourself, well, why are we doing failures? And there's a couple of people really doing a lot of research up in North Carolina about the role of failure in new product development. Boy, is that not a PhD thesis or what? Anybody done a PhD thesis? Anybody here? Anybody ever proposed a PhD thesis or been involved? Where you go to the professor and you say, I got this wonderful idea. What I want to do is I want to examine why people fail all the time and why some people don't. Well, we would argue that it's about knowledge. Anybody got any questions yet? All right, because we're on a, we've got plenty of time. Oh, Lord. All right, so we know that one reason why we fail is we have too many requirements. And I use this word requirement in this industry because that seems to be a buzzword. We need a lot of requirements. Who needs requirements, by the way? Anybody? Who needs requirements? So what? The developer? All right. Who else needs requirements? Maybe the customer? Oh, anybody, well, a lot of people spend money on stuff they don't need. Wouldn't you agree? They buy a lot of things. That, but all right, so the point is a requirement defines a new product for somebody, hopefully. Now, everybody's heard this rule about requirements. You get requirements from customers, right? Is that not true? Hasn't that mantra been beaten into you? So 50% of the customers don't know what they want, so they lie. Anybody ever heard that? You know that over 50% of your customers, you go and say, oh, what's your name, young lady? Elena. Elena. May, I, may we role play? All right. Thank, well, I, you can volunteer Bill there if you want. No, I did All right, Elena, what do you want in a product? What's the most important thing in the product you, you want? What is it? Alright, who wants to volunteer back up there? We in the back. Those guys working on their computers. Yeah. So what does innovativeness mean to you? Now you can't answer yet. They're, they're being stuck because they're working on their computers, see? So what does innovativeness mean to you? Different than our competitor. Different than our competitor. Well, so now we get we got a requirement, don't we? <laughs> Anybody see how that was so easy to do? It's different. Good Lord, you know that this whole mantra and methodology about requirements is doomed. And there's data to show that this approach is not for everybody, in fact, just a few. But we'll talk a little bit about that. How many of you have heard your boss say, all we need, or the big guy gets in, he calls everybody together. And you got, anybody here got war rooms? Anybody got any of that stuff? Golly, you know, we're not even, are we at war or not? I've, I've lost sight of what decade I'm in. Uh, so we're in war, and we've got to have a war room because our competition is someplace in Bangladesh or India, right? And so we get in a war room, and the boss says, what we need to be is very, what? Focused. Do you know what? At the requirement stage, that's absolutely wrong. The data shows that you want to be totally the opposite. You want to be open-minded. You want to have, uh, you want to be able to envision beyond the obvious and what your customer told you. So we're starting off with two bad assumptions and we're going to go downhill from there. And the bottom line of this is, is if you like the free fall, you'll hit a terminal velocity. Anybody here ever done any physics? You know, you're dropping down. What lady raises her hand all the time? I like her a lot back there in the corner. All right, so you're dropping down. You jumped out of a perfectly good airplane, you, and you're dropping down. You hit a terminal velocity. What most people seem to think in terminal velocity is you're not moving very fast. It's just that you can't move any faster. No matter how you focus, you can't move any faster. Now, the hopeful thing is, is that you have some parachute. So the second thing is to be very, very focused. That leads to a narrow vision. Why do people talk about visions today in new product development? 
and methodologies. Why do they talk about visions today? Anybody? Because you're supposed to be able to draw a mental picture over what the customer's looking for. Isn't that the teachings? But if you have a very narrow vision, what are you going to see? You're only going to see the spot you're focused on. You will not see the hills, the trees. I was in Antarctica this time a month ago. Having a marvelous time watching penguins down at uh, Murdo, what, Murdo Beach or Murdo Station. Excuse me, it wasn't a beach. It was, it was in the middle of summer. It was bombing 34 degrees. And so you're watching penguins, and you know what you do? You just sit down, and the penguins kind of like come over and check you out. You know, the social media people a little earlier, I think they're onto something. But one penguin comes over, chop, 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 chop. I didn't understand that penguin. Uh, he was a king penguin, so he was speaking funny language. Uh, then another, he went back and told a friend, and all pretty soon we had all these penguins around. And let me tell you, they have long beaks. <coughs> And they like my coat. So where was my focus? And another little thing. Do you know that penguins stink? A little detail. They poop a lot, too. They're a regular poop machine of fish. So three big things that are common knowledge. So where am I going with all this? We want speed to market. We want terminal velocity. Well, when we sit back and we think about how we do things, we go back to the first time you were ever told in school, if you took a science class, how in the world do you do a science project? Anybody remember that? Am I the only one that got involved in science projects for the science fair at school? Nobody else? What about you? Raise your hand, please. Thank you. Somebody over there. Nobody else. Anybody take science? <laughs> All right. Is it, was it the seventh grade? You were in the seventh grade and you took science, and they said, oh, there is the seven step science project methodology. And this is what everybody has been taught to this day. If you're filling out a National Science Institute grant and you're going for Boku money, you're going to lay these steps out in your, in your grant writing. And so you're going to have state the problem as a question. That doesn't sound difficult, does it? Then it says, form a hypothesis, number two. Anybody know how to spell hypothesis? Anybody? Couple, couple over here, over here. Anybody who can do it without spell check? Yeah, she can do it without spell check. She raised her hand. All right, third one, develop a plan, duh. Fourth one, do the, uh, develop the procedure of the experiment. Fifth one, do the work. Sixth one, state the results. Seventh one is draw conclusions. That is the mantra that people have been taught forever about innovation, and it's wrong. There's a study out. I can dig up the reference if you all want to give me your name or something at the end. I can, there's studies out using something today that is called uh, fMRI. Is anybody familiar with an fMRI? doing some brilliant work. If you aren't keeping track in the marketing world of the work that's being done with fMRI, you are going to be behind schedule. And it's spelled with an F. So some, somebody asked me last time I gave this speech, they said, how do you, how do you spell that? Okay, folks, F-M-R-I. You know? But they measure where the brain activity is. Well, anyway, what they found is, is that when this work, when you use these seven steps, Little thing happened. It was logical and objective. Pass that test, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem logical? State the problem and then state the conclusions at the end. Doesn't that all flow together? Would you agree? How about back there? How about over there? You agree? And then some guy like me walks up and says, well, you're all wrong. So this is wrong, wrong, wrong. You want to do innovation? You want to do product management? Because if you want to be a successful product manager, which I have been, then what you really need to do as a successful product manager is launch a lot of new revenue. And if you're good at launching revenue, they promote you. Because they, the company, love you for getting more revenue. Because more revenue means what? 
more profit. And that allows you to hire a larger staff. And when you get above four people, they got to call you something different. So they might call you a team leader, then a group leader, then a director leader, and then upwards and upwards and upwards, and then you get fired. But that's another story. <laughs> so what do we know? When, when scientists, when scientists look at this material, when they look at their work, they come up with some problems. The data doesn't fit. Some people in some of the best labs in the country, if we look at lab uh, laboratories, 70 to 75% of all experiments have data that shouldn't be there. Isn't that a hoot? 70 to 75, other labs will admit that maybe only 50% of the data shouldn't be there. In other words, there's, there's data there that doesn't agree with this procedure. So what does a good scientist do? And these are really, so what, is, what do these people do? They look and they check their equipment. Has anybody ever worked and expected an outcome and then gone back and checked the equipment? Or the other thing that did is that we did something wrong, so they fire the lab technicians. Anybody ever seen that happen? You know, it's the subordinate didn't do the experiment right. And this is the real world, folks, and lives, people designing, etc. It's something we did wrong. The data doesn't fit our hypothesis. So what happens? So let's look at why this occurs. When you do these experiments, very good people are working hard. These are good people. These aren't idiots. These aren't inc incompetents. The equipment is the best in the world. And yet still, over 50% of the data generated from their experiments doesn't fit the hypothesis. Isn't that a hoot? So what do they do? A lot of times they abandon the work. But other things they do is they want to say in the experiment, that what we're trying to do is prove our hypothesis so everything we know is known. I've actually seen scientists anecdotally take the data out because it didn't fit. It's called normalization of data. Anybody ever seen that? You bet. Thank you. What about over here? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. You. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, you know, I, I one time watched a guy take the data and the curve went this way. The curve went this way. He took out some data points, and the curve went that way. You know, and it fit his hypothesis. Of course, when we sold the product and everything to the customer, it had a minor little detail. It didn't work. And of course, that's em that's embarrassing. Anybody ever sold a product that doesn't work? Am I the only one? No. Come on. Has anybody ever sold a product that didn't work? You all are a bunch of software people, aren't you? Whoever has software working right the first time. Oh, come on. We make the experiment fit the theory. This is what these studies have shown, that when they go and interview these scientists that have this abnormality data, they find that the individual is designing his or her experiments to fit the hypothesis. Lastly, they pick and choose. So let's step back a second. A couple of Nobel laureates in 1976, two physicists out of Bell Labs got the Nobel Prize for physics. Anybody want to know what they won in, no in 1976? They actually had done some real work. So this was back in the good old days for Nobel Prizes. Um, so in 1976, what did they do? What did they do? Well, they started in 1948 trying to map the Milky Way with the world's largest radio telescope. Now, why they put it in New Jersey, I have no idea, but apparently that was the main headquarters of Bell Labs. I would never have done that. But And what did they discover? They couldn't map the Milky Way from 1948 on. And they had a signal that kept um, asking all the data that was coming from the Milky Way. And so from 19, 
1948 to 1964, they worked on checking the equipment. Now, if my math's right, that's somewhere around 16 years. So they dismantled the whole thing. They redid it. They checked all the connections. They got gold connectors because gold's a better co conductor of stuff and all this. And they did all sorts of reconfigurations. They could never get rid of that signal. And then one day, they went and talked to a guy who happened to have been interested in a theory. And the theory said that the universe was composed of all this shrapnel, he called it. That's a funny term for a physicist. But where, came, where did this shrapnel come from? Anybody know? Microwave Just guess. Microwave radiation. All right, but where did the shrapnel come from? Big Bang. Big Bang. Everybody knows the Big Bang today, but back then, it wasn't the Big Bang. So what they got their Nobel Prize for was the discovery of the, and the proof of the Big Bang Theory, where they proved that all these signals were, were uh, accelerating away, and, that was ex and wherever they turned it, they could measure the uh, radiation that was coming off of this big explosion. Now, I don't want to get too deep into that topic, uh, because I don't know what I'm really talking about. But uh, from a physicist standpoint, they got rewarded for innovation in 1976. They didn't get their breakthrough in their idea six, till 16 years later. And what they say when they write about it is they were not looking for this piece of data. They were not looking for this piece of data. And so then you ask yourself, why weren't you looking for it? Well, th there was a couple of reasons. But in general, what did they do? They had already made an hypothesis. And this is what I would urge you about new product development, is be careful of your hypothesis. But I'm going to give you some other things that go along with this. Now, not all data should be treated equally. Now, we've got a bunch of friends of mine in here from the market research community, and they'll probably say yes, maybe, okay, Ken, who knows, uh, but that's okay. But what's funny is what happens to your brain. It appears that one of the last pieces of your brain to develop as an adolescent is something called the DLPFC. I am not going to pronounce the scientific name of that. But it's a little gland in your brain that develops in your late teens that says, oh, This data doesn't exist, and it eliminates it from your brain. It just looks at it, and it hits the delete button immediately. Isn't that fascinating? That we have in our brain a gland, a part of our mapping of our brain, that says we have, we have an unconscious, unconscious delete button. That when we're presented data, abnormalities, we delete it. And that's the point I'm trying to get across here today and this is how do you get there faster you got to come to grips with this automatic delete button that's in your brain this gland because if you're deleting something right away what happens to your experiment what do you what happens to your experiment what happens to the work you do if you're if you're doing product management or anything like this what happens well, you're going to walk away from the data. You're going to walk away from the input. Would everybody agree with that? If it's no longer in your brain, it means that it's not important to you and you're not going to use it. Now, it turns out there's another little gland in your brain. It's called the uh, scientific name is Aw Shit. <laughs> its real name is the ACC gland. Now, the Aw Shit button goes like this. Oh, Aw Shit. I just discovered something new. This is why when people go in and they say, what do you know, Ms. Customer or Mr. Customer? There's a good chance that that person has been hitting the delete button and you're trying to figure out what they have learned new that you can put in your product or your product management. They've deleted all the good stuff already. But every once in a while, you run across somebody who has the ACC button. 
called the ah shit. They've had an epiphany. They've had an insight. How many people have met people who have insights? Anybody know any people that have epiphanies, insights? Those are really people that you want in your network. You know, the person who is always hitting the other button, what do we call the other button? Was the DLPFC button. Boy, isn't that aware? You know, only a teenager could come up with that Twitter name. Uh, all right, so here we are. The human brain filters. So as a product manager, if you're looking for things to look at new, where are you going to find new stuff? Talk to other product managers? The truth of the matter is, is they're clueless as you are. And I'm not making this up. I'm being a little funny for effect. I'm trying to get that lady to continue to wave at me. She's doing a good job. I like that. But here's where we're going. The brain has chemistry in the brain that affects how you think. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand your stimulants, you don't understand the stimuli, you don't understand what type of people you're looking for, you will repeat history time and time and time again. Now, let's go and start to wrap this up and we'll do some Q&A if you'd like. When you have abnormal data, abnormal data, Maybe this time around, just do me a favor and look at it and spend a lot of time wondering why that piece of data occurred. You know, I do this thing with people who do, we do uh, studies on uh, market segments for innovation. And some people, I'll come back and we'll say, you know, 30% of the customers say, or the prospects will say they'll buy, 70% said, heck no. And we go to some clients and they go, well, I will throw that idea out. Yeah. Boy, because what is their brain? 30% is pretty low, isn't it? Would you agree? 30% is low? Would you throw that idea? Well, maybe those 30% will buy, and what you've done is got another segmentation going on. And if you can satisfy that 30%, maybe they not only will buy, but they'll buy at the top end of the value chain here. So a lot of things, study these abnormalities. When you get a market research report, look at the person if they go through whether we got this persona. How many people do personas? Anybody got weird personas? I mean, I've read some, you know, church going, going, church going, you know, white male, 36, two and a half kids, you know, wife works, uh, he takes out the trash, he changes diapers, you know. Anybody got any really good, weird personas? How many people here, raise your hand if you believe that more than 10% of the population of the world is weird? Raise your hand. 10% of the population is weird. Uh, more than 10%, raise your hand. All right, less than 1% of the population is weird. Okay, we got that. All right, so maybe we have to ask what his definition of weird is. That might be a little fun. Uh, but the second part is, is 10% of what's the world's population? What is, I, I lost track of where China is anymore, but you know, that's just a small detail. China is one quarter of the world's population, so you know. So let's, what is it, four or five billion? Six, Six billion? Six oh. billion. Oh. So that's me, let's do the math. Let's take decimal point over one, that makes it what, six trillion? That's, that's Washington, D.C. map, I understand. <laughs> All right. So here's what I'm trying to get to. you got filters. Acknowledge the abnormalities. An overused word that was quite popular in business a number of years ago, and it got used for all the wrong reasons, but it's called the word paradigm. Write down what you think is really going on. And write it down in a way that you're looking for shifts. The last bit here is start revolutions. We have so many tools today to start revolutions. I get one, to, I get one on an email, and it says, uh, it says, what is, I think it said something like, if you print this email out, you'll save a tree. Anybody get those? Anybody get those on the body? You know, now they say, you know, if you, don't, if you print this email out, you'll save a tree, or these other things. But the whole message is that you can start revolutions. 
using social networks, LinkedIn, all sorts of ways. The point of the revolution is, is that you want people of diverse thinking to be part of your effort. Because what we have learned so far, and this work is still ongoing at the Center for Creative Leadership in North Carolina, is what they've learned so far is diversity of thinking styles is more powerful than having a bunch of people who are all the same. If you want to have lack of diversity, not start a revolution, don't do any change, just do what, uh, do what your predecessor did. Good. Ah. Let's see, what am I going to do? So here's what the, uh, and you can get this uh, presentation if you want. I think it's going to be on uh, one of the, uh, I got lost. What is the website now named for this uh, product camp? But I'll figure it out. Anyways, it'll be there or send me an email. I can do that. But anyways, the four things that we want to talk about is check your assumptions on any project. Sit there and take the time and write down your assumptions. You should get into that habit. Now, I'm not going to ask you how many people write down their assumptions because the assumption is what? That you actually do it. So if we look back at whatever was something important, maybe it was a pricing decision, maybe it was a product build, something of this nature, we're going to ask you. Seek out the ignorant. All right, so who, anybody know anybody ignorant in your company? <laughs> now, you got to go below the, uh, the VP or the C level. I'll tell you that. It's a little hazardous. Say, so I want to include you in this conversation because I consider you ignorant. Would you all agree with that? But I want to say this. Who do you go to lunch with? Everybody go to lunch? Anybody do lunch anymore? Oh, yeah. Okay. If you, the way to look at this is to, you can substitute the word ignorant for diverse. Invite somebody you don't like, you don't, would never socialize with to lunch, and talk about your problem. And if you set it up right, if you set it up correctly, you will wind up with that individual learning from them. He, will be, he or she will be telling you something that here the four, your network of friends had never talked about. You have to accept that your hypothesis, if the odds are, or the probabilities, the odds, or whatever is about, that your hypothesis is wrong, will lead to failure. You know, we teach project management sometimes, and I tell everybody, uh, in project management, you should spend a third of your time planning and making sure you're solving the right problem. It's amazing how many people want to get into the, plan, the details, the work, and they, and they don't even think about, are we really working on the right problem? And that's when all of a sudden later on, one of those smart people on your teams, and they're sitting in the war room, and it's, what, 7.30 in the morning, a stand-up war room type of thing? And somebody says, ah, shit. And the boss says, I don't want to hear it. Uh, because that ah, shit statement was they just had an insight. But it's going to change the project plan, isn't it? Anybody ever been in when they all of a sudden had that big ah, hat? And they said, oh, we got to change the project plan. Well, the project plan is sacrosanct. Anybody said, heard that? They even have offices around the country. They have offices of project management. Anybody work under that? What a, what a weird thing, concept. Sorry, doesn't work. Uh, let's see, beware of failure blindness. Uh, this is basically that the idea of what you're working on doesn't work. But if we throw more people at it, if we spend more money, we force the customers to try it, we'll take it to our best customers, still doesn't work. When is somebody going to say enough, it's a failure, and move on? One of the most difficult things for companies to do when they're free-falling is to recognize that you forgot your parachute and you're just going to be a squat. Because when the customer doesn't buy, the customer doesn't buy, and the product doesn't sell, and what happens? We get a whole bunch of new people in we have to train. 
Well, that's the sort of thing. Anyways, that's my little speech on uh, free fall new product development and some of the new work that's going on. And I here to suspect that probably today in every session you're going to hear about stuff. But I don't, sus I don't think you'll hear about brand new research that's coming out that will change how people do things in product management. So questions. Questions. Right down there. Yeah. I really like your perspective. Do you have a, in, like, to stay connected, do you have a Twitter address that we can stay in? No. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe you can show me. I got a LinkedIn. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I got that. I've been thinking about a blog. But they, somebody told me that was old hat, so I don't know about that. <laughs> but, but I'm looking for somebody who would help our company do social media. That's also hint, 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 hint. You know? All right. But no, I don't have a Twitter. I really wish I, you know, that stuff, but I don't. Other questions? New product development. Yes, sir? This is more of a, a comment, but along the lines of, of the wrong hypothesis, I, I find often that people, they, they have the wrong causality. So, they believe a lot of times that this is this is what can cause sales because the customer says this. When in fact, the customer really wants you know, something else entirely that doesn't know. Yeah. But you can never figure out what causes what. A lot of times, the, the same thing causes both things to happen. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, I think discernment should not be left to amateurs. And salespeople clearly are amateurs. Uh, in product management, uh, and so you know, I just uh, back in the good old days when I got a note from the Salesforce, they needed this new product. I just put it at the bottom of the pile, and which meant it never got to it. Uh, now, if when I don't, I'm retired, so if I have an email, I put it in the B category of to-do list, which means bottom. Uh, it, it just gets done badly. It's done badly. Very rarely do you have these great epiphanies that come along that everybody holds up. You know, uh, Blue Ocean, wonderful book, uh, but you need a big telescope, a really big telescope, to be successful with that. But good comment. Anybody else? Yeah. Anything back there? Cool. Yes, sir. So, um, can I take us through the, the, the new? science process then, which I have to comment, I, I disagree. I think sales guys have a lot of good value in, in through the... I think they have uh, great value. You need to talk to sales guys and, and they need to work together on innovation. Yeah. Um, no, that's true. So, so I like how you're very science approached. Um, so talk us through the new science. Well, there's a whole body of work that's been going on for about five years, studying how the brain works with innovation, creativity, how the brain learns, and how the brain connects the dots, if you will. So, so more specific than that, in the field of product management, how do we get out in front of our customers, and whether iterative process, whether show and tell, or what, because I think we all do that, and we're trying to figure out how to do it better. We all we all come up with screenshots. We all come up with well, the, yeah, but uh, there's some science there. Here's how many people go to customers with a PowerPoint presentation. Come on, raise your hands. How many people go to customers with a PowerPoint presentation? Let me show you what we're doing in product management. Worst tool ever invented by Microsoft, except for project management. <laughs> now, why? Here's the issue. If you're going to ask the customer, this is why I say don't leave it to amateurs. If you're going to ask the customer what they're looking for, you have to work through two big barriers. The first one is they may not know, but they're not going to admit it. How many times have you told somebody something because you didn't want to say, I don't know? Very human nature to do that difficulty. The second thing is, is that if you're only using two senses, voice and sight, which is what PowerPoint is, you're only going to get 30% of what they know about that topic. Isn't that a hoot? To go back to the science side, what it says is if you engage more senses, you will get a better answer from that person. If you can figure out a way to get five senses 
all of them engage, you will get the best answer that person has because it's the largest part. The, the, their whole part of the innovation brain is now working. But a PowerPoint and words don't get you, get you a small wedge. And that's where I want to come back. I really appreciate what you said, and I probably was went for the cheap joke on the salespeople, but it was easy. Uh, hey, yeah, one minute. Jason was wanting me to wrap that up for the next one coming up. All right. Heads up. Heads up. Uh, that being said, uh, Ken Westray, uh, let me, you want to? Be glad to talk more about it, but uh, we have a company called MP Learning, and we can reach me at ken at mplearning.com. So I do have an email address. I'm not that. Ar ar